seminary to that end. Bless the professors that they may instruct the young men that thou dost place there. We delight we to be able to instruct not only men from our denomination with a view to their becoming ministers of thy word here within us, but also to assist the broader body of Jesus Christ with whom we have connections and relationships. We thank thee that we may be able to show that the body is far bigger than our denomination in those relationships. We pray for our sister church in Northern Ireland, and we ask thee to give thy blessing to them. Bless the denomination in Australia with whom we have corresponding relationships. F further, and encourage each other. The smallness of our sizes indicates that we have battled hard in the past, but may we know that there is strength in each other. And may we hear each other and be blessings to each other. Bless the aspiring relationships in Singapore and in the Philippines. We pray for thy blessing upon the saints there. We again ask thee to give thy blessing to Professor and Mrs. Hanka, who will be traveling to Singapore soon. May they be blessed and be means of blessing. Encourage and build up the saints in the Reformed faith there. Bless the work in the Philippines. We ask that thou wilt in a special way be with the missionaries who experience the unsettledness sometimes in a very concrete way of the what it means to live in a different country. Encourage them. May not their external circumstances take away their zeal for the truth and the proclamation of it and the privilege of proclaiming it to others, not only to the congregation there, but also to their mission work and then to the other congregations that aspire to learn and to grow with them in the knowledge of the Reformed faith. We thank thee for the faith of the Reformation. It is humbling, so very humbling, because it teaches us that salvation is by grace alone, but may we know that thou dost dwell with those that are humbled, humbled by grace, humbled in the knowledge of their depravity, but that thou dost dwell with them in the most intimate of ways to encourage and to lift them up. Bless us in the instruction of our children. We pray thy blessing in the catechism room. Encourage the young people and the children there, and especially work within some of the young men whom it is thy pleasure to use in the ministry of the word. Bless our elders, our office bearers. We thank thee for them. We pray for our deacons as they go in and out among us. Give them great compassion. Wisdom, yes, but more than anything, show them thy mercy experientially. That they may be able to reflect mercy. May we be active in giving the deacons the means to show that mercy in a concrete way. So that when they collect the alms, when they come to us, may we be willing to give. May thy blessing rest with our elders that they may exhibit an attitude and a life that is above reproach, being blameless. At the same time, give them compassion for the sheep of the flock.
Give them wisdom to know how to guide us, especially when there can be tenseness and difficulties. May they be there to assure us of calm and peace in Christ. We thank thee for them and pray thy blessing, thy encouraging blessing upon them. Bless us in the instruction of our children. May we be diligent to teach them by classrooms, but, uh, but especially by attitudes, to show them the way they are to live. To the glory of thee, their God. May our children, already in an early age, learn that thou art their helper in the strife, their strong defender, their mighty shield, and that they don't have to defend themselves to know that thou art their defender. Forgive. Forgive all our sins. We cannot stand before thy throne of grace without seeing ourselves as dirty, as corrupt, so give thy blessing to us, Lord, by assuring us Christ died. We're righteous. May thy blessing be with those that aren't with us here. Continue to bless the Muhlenbergs, that little baby. We thank thee for its safe delivery. And we pray that now thou wilt provide an opportunity for it soon to return home. Continue to restore strength to others to face surgeries and trials. May we look at them as opportunities. Opportunities that thou dost give. Opportunities to walk in a closer relationship with thee. So bless, Father, Hear our prayer. Forgive our sins of this prayer too. In the name of Christ, amen. Let's express our gratitude to God now in our giving, first of all, for the cause of domestic missions, and then secondly, for that of Protestant Reform Special Education. Let's use Psalter number 300 now with which to praise our God. 300 taken from Psalm 109. O God, whom I delight to praise, to thee my cry for help I raise. Be thou my friend and advocate. Let's sing these stanzas, 1 and 5, and then 8 and 9. 1, 5, 8, and 9 of 300. <coughs>
We continue in our series of the consideration of the journey of children of Israel through the wilderness in the book of Numbers by reading from Numbers 16. Numbers chapter 16. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Pelath, sons of Reuben, took men, and rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among us. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face, and he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show you who are his, and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do. Take you censers, Korah and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. And Moses said unto Korah, here I pray you, ye sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to him to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation to minister unto him? And he brought, and he brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also? For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron, that ye murmur against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us out of the land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness, except thou make thyself to altogether a prince over us? Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey, or given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. And Moses was very wroth, and said unto the Lord, Respect not thou their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. And Moses said unto Korah, be thou and all thy company before the Lord, thou and they and Aaron tomorrow, and take every man his censer, and put incense in them, and bring ye before the Lord every man his censer, two hundred and fifty censers, thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. And they took every man his censer, and put fire in them, and made, laid incense thereon, and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces and said, O oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up, and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their tents and all their sins. So they get up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents, and their wives, and their sons, and their little children. And Moses said, 
Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own hand. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make the, a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder from that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods, they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Eleazar the son of Aaron the priest, that he take up the censers out of the burning, and scatter thou the fire yonder, for they are hallowed. The censers of these sinners against their own souls, let them make them broad plates for a covering of the altar, for they offered them before the Lord, therefore they are hallowed, and they shall be a sign unto the children of Israel. And Eleazar the priest took the brazen censers, wherewith they that were burnt had offered, and they were there and they were made broad plates for a covering of the altar to be a memorial unto the children of Israel that no stranger which is not of the seed of Aaron may come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he be not as Korah and his company, as the Lord said to him by the hand of Moses. But on the morrow... All the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. And it came to pass, when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces, and Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer, and put fire therein from off the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly unto the congregation, and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord, the plague is begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded, and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people, and he put on incense, and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Now, they that died in the plague were 14,700, beside them that died after about the matter of Korah. And Aaron returned unto Moses, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the plague was stayed. May God bless our reading of his holy word. You will notice that we didn't treat what's given to us in chapter 15. There are laws that God gives there about sundry offerings. There's also the interesting incident of a man who gathered sticks on the Sabbath, who was, by the commandment of God, stoned to death. And then the 15th chapter ends with the law about fringes on their garments. You're going to find the same sorts of things in chapters 18 and 19. While we will not be treating them specifically, don't lose the sense that whether it be an historical incident like that which we are treating tonight, or those rules and laws that are given in the chapters 15, 18, and 19, in all cases, 
God is working, just as He is always today, with us. Working to shape and mold us to be a holy people. A holy people. He teaches us, He instructs us in truth, but He's always working to shape and mold us to fit us for that heavenly Canaan. So God is at work, even in those rules and laws, as well as in the history. We've chosen just to deal with the history. Instructive is the commentary that Scripture gives from the book of Jude on the incident tonight. The book of Jude, we have, as you know, one short chapter a chapter that really parallels what you find in the second chapter of Second Peter. They almost are, if you would make an outline of the two, they'd be right next to each other, almost identical. Here in Jude, he calls the people to whom he's writing to remember. In verse 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. After he delivered them out of, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, he destroyed them that believed not. And then he goes on in verse 6 to talk about the angels that fell from their holy estate and followed the devil. Then he mentions Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 7 and 8. Then he speaks of how Michael didn't dare give a final word or have the ability to give a final word when he wrestled with the devil over the body of Moses. Then he says this in verse 11. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and they perished in the gainsaying of Korah. He wants them to know that no matter who has sinned, the appearance, the appearance from earthly perspective is that they get away with it. But he comes back and he lets them know, both in 2 Peter 2 and here in Jude, that God's got a record. And he visits. And this history that we have now here in number 16 is a part of the evidence reassuring God's people that he will judge. That we don't have to do it. That he will judge. The sin of, of Korah, as it's described in Jude 11, is called gainsaying. The Greek word that's translated gainsaying means literally anti-logic. Anti-logic. Rather interesting translation. A word which says and is, is accurately translated in other places of Scripture, contradictory, opposing, rebelling. To contradict and to rebel, from God's perspective, is against logic. It's anti-logical. That's gainsay. If you know that the Lord has set those in authority over you, then to rebel against them is to rebel against Him. 
to put it in the most simplest of terms, anti-logic to do that. We consider a lot of history covered in these 50 verses of number 16. We consider their gainsaying or their rebellion. And then we consider their di the divine judgment. As the chapter begins, we see three factions. First, there's Korah. Korah as an individual. He's a Levite, a Kohath, so one of the three sons of, of Levi. He had the privilege of camping with the other Levites directly around the tabernacle. Moses and Aaron were on the east side. But they were right there, right next to the tabernacle. That's where he camped and pitched. And that was his work. He is jealous because Aaron is given with his sons the privilege of being high priest and serving in what he sees to be a greater and more honorable way which he covets and desires for himself. Kohath, or Korah. Then there's Dathan and Abiram and On. Dathan and Abiram are brothers. On is a, another descendant of Reuben. The three are from the tribe of Reuben. They're jealous because of the political leadership that is that of Moses. They don't see it as something God gave to Moses. They just see it as a leadership that belongs to Moses and they would rather have it because Reuben is the firstborn and he should have that privilege of leading politically the family. Not a Levite. The third faction are the 250 princes. Men of some preeminence, of some importance, of they're, they're not listed with the elders that followed Moses, but they nevertheless are gathered from among the leaders of the tribes. But from the way in which Moses speaks to all of them at the end of 7 and, not, and 8, it seems that most of the 250 were from the tribe of Levi. And again, their jealousy for the positions of Moses and Aaron is that they would have for themselves the right to be able to worship in the tabernacle and to go into it itself. Are, what we, are, are not the whole nation holy? Is not God with all of us? Cannot we also have that right? That's the way they spoke. It is very difficult to know the timing of this incident in the 38 and a half years of wandering in the wilderness. We don't know exactly where it's placed. There was some time that took place after what we had at the end of chapter 14 when God said, no, you have to fulfill a year for all of the, for each day that the spies were in the land of Canaan, you have to die from 20 years old and upward you're going to spend a total of 40 years in the wilderness. We don't know exactly when. Some time had passed when this incident takes place. Some of the same attitudes are there. Why should we have to be in the wilderness for this long of a time? We don't need to be here. But more particularly now, their focus is on we would like to have the leadership. They were jealous they spoke against Moses and Aaron. There are not a whole lot of events that are recorded in this history of the children of Israel in those 40 years. But it is striking that this is the second time we find the same sin brought to our attention. The first time was Miriam. She spoke against Moses. Stirred up Aaron to join her. 
And now we see Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and they gathered a crowd among, um, to join them in the same kind of verbal abuse that they would bring against those that God had placed in authority over them. They refused to acknowledge the right and the justice of their wandering in the wilderness. That's the background. That's the setting. They didn't want that. And they blame Moses and Aaron, but particularly Moses now, for keeping them in the wilderness and not bringing them to that land that flows with milk and honey. Korah and the 250 wanted to be more active in worship. It seems they already had censors. That's not Moses' idea, and it's good to know that. Because Moses had a very vivid memory of what happens when you think you can bring your own censer and incense into the tabernacle of God. Do you remember? Moses' oldest nephews, the oldest two sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, they took censers. They took fire that was not from the altar of burnt offerings. They took their own fire. But they wanted to bring incense and go right into the tabernacle, the most, the holy place, the holy place of God. And that was right after the tabernacle had been built. Remember how Nadab and Abihu were killed? Killed. Charred. Fire came down from heaven and burned them up. Right there. So Moses could have predicted what was going to happen. But Moses didn't put the test to them. They had their censors, all 250. And so Moses declared to them, you believe that you can do it, then we'll follow your suggested way of doing it. I want you to notice that these 250 presented their case in what I'll call a normal, sinful way. They presented their case this way. Is not the whole of the nation holy? Are not we all Worthy? Verse 3. And then they've stirred each other up. God is with us. It's rare that the consistory or a pastor gets a phone call or a letter and it's and the reference in the letter is only to that person and their own judgment. It is far more common that that phone call or that letter includes something like this. I've been talking to others and they agree with me. I've got a lot of people behind me, is the idea. Hear the... Korah's got 250. And the 250 say, we've got everybody else. What is interesting to note is the way in which Moses answers them in 7 and 8. We will let the Lord decide 
it was the Lord who decided initially, and now we will let the Lord decide who will have that holiness that enables them to enter into the holy place and offer incense. Let the Lord decide whom he will choose. And then he adds at the end of 7, You take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. These sons of Levi forgot that not only had God appointed Aaron, but they forgot the tremendous privilege that was already theirs. So he says in 9, Seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you, one tribe out of all thirteen, to bring you near to him? You camp right around the tabernacle. You carry the instruments of the tabernacle when we travel. To stand before the congregation, to minister unto them, is not that enough? And isn't that the typical way we think? Whenever we want more, we forget what we already have. Instead of being aware, constantly aware, that what we have is a gift. You really have to start before that. You really have to start this way. What is it that I deserve? When I'm ready to complain, when I think life isn't fair, then I forget first to consider I deserve hell. When false charges are placed upon one and, and they're not correct or they're not worded accurately or they're twisted and they're really not the right and we're ready to stand up in defense and say, you got it wrong, and this is the reason, and that's the reason. And then we forget. I deserve hell. And I may never forget that. That's always where I've got to start out. In every difficulty, what do I deserve? Then you can appreciate, and then the sons of Levi should have appreciated Look at the privileges that are yours. You came forward to be on the Lord's side. You have the privilege of being able to serve in the tabernacle. None of the others. You guard the tabernacle from the rest of the congregation. That's your privilege. And now you want more? We do the same sort of thing when we're worried about tomorrow or the next day or the day after that or next month. Whenever we are that far ahead, then we have absolutely no appreciation for how we feel and how things are today. We have robbed ourselves of the joy of appreciating the blessings that are ours now. The Reubenites accused Moses of setting himself up. And they're rather evil in how they say it. Look at how they put it in verse 13. Is it a small thing? First, they're mimicking Moses. Moses had just said that to the Levites in the 250. So they copy him. You can almost Here's them, when they say it, saying it just like Moses said it. Is it a small thing? Secondly, notice their great distortion. They talk about being taken out of a land flowing with milk and honey. That's the language that God used for Canaan, never for Egypt. They use it with regard to Egypt. 
But they do it as a part of their argument to point a finger of accusation against Moses. You took us out of there so you could be the king and the ruler and the leader here. You want to set yourself up as prince. You want to hog all the attention and get our, be the big man. God responds. Let's not overlook the very first way God responds. When the one who has been the pictorial mediator, picture of Jesus' work as mediator, when their earthly mediator is, according to verse 4, grieved, and he falls upon his face. That's not the way we want our mediator to be. That's a judgment that God gives to us. And then secondly, in verse 15, when Moses, in response to the charges of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, responds with a righteous at wrath. Here again, their mediator, the one who interceded for them in the past many times, when he is angry with them with a righteous anger, and he now prays as their mediator, respect not their offering, that's divine judgment. Secondly, Moses responds to them by complying with their wishes. He prayed that God would not respect them, but with boldness. And I wonder if it wasn't the case that Moses reminded them about Nadab and Abihu. You want to use this test. Don't you remember? But with boldness they come forward with their censers the next morning, ready to give their offerings and to make their, take upon themselves the right to enter into the holy place. God responds, both in 19 and in 42, in the same way. Just as he had before, suddenly this pillar becomes, though it's in the daytime, it becomes a, a glorious pillar. It was a pillar of cloud during the day, fire by night. But now during the day, it becomes a cloud of fire, of glory, that, that catches the attention of all of the congregation of the children of Israel. And the first thing that God does is he says to Moses and Aaron, just as he had said before, verse 21, separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. Again, again, don't say that God is changing his mind. God uses this as a tremendous lesson to teach us the kind of mediator they had and we have. Ours is perfect, but this is an opportunity when it seems absolutely unreasonable for the mediator to stand in the way and to pray anything but curse him, Lord, do it, and to be a cheerleader to God's willingness to consume them in a moment. That's when the mediator, Moses and Aaron, fell upon their faces and pleaded with God. But God said, separate yourself from them. Don't identify yourself with them and associate yourselves with them. In heeding Moses' plea, we'll talk about that a bit later, God then said, okay, you said to me, why should the whole nation perish because of one or a few? Then do this, separate yourselves and tell all of the congregation 
to separate themselves from the tents of these three men. Now Korah was camped right around the tabernacle. When the 250 came with their censers, Korah was right there. His tent had to be very, very close to the tabernacle, right there. But part of the sin of Nadab and Abihu, and I, I forgot to mention that, was this. When Moses called them to come to him, they refused. They thought that that would fit in with their argument against him. You make yourself the leader. You're not our leader. We don't have to hear you. We don't have to follow you. We don't have to heed your command to come. We're not going to come. So Moses, with the elders of Israel following him, had a walk to them. The banner of Reuben, remember, was on the south side of the tabernacle. Found those two tents. They might have been close because they camped as families. They were brothers. And Moses loudly tells all of the people, separate yourselves. Korah's way over there. Nathan and Abiram are over here. Separate yourselves from being near to them. And here's the test. If these men die like everybody else dies, then God has not sent me. But if the earth open up and they go alive down into the pit, then no, and now we would expect Moses to say that I am the chosen leader. Notice his humility. He doesn't talk about himself. He says, if, if the earth open up and swallow them, and they don't die a normal death, then know that they have done worse than to me. They have provoked Jehovah. The record is that Dathan and Abiram continue their defiance. They come out and they stand in the door of their tent with their wives, with their children, their, even their little children. They come out and they stand in the door of the tents of their tabernacle, of their tents, and they defy Moses. And God opens up the earth. And they fall screaming. Korah's over there. Dathan and Abiram's here. And it closes back up. A judgment of eternal damnation. That's the way that Moses worded it. And they all perished. And as soon as that was finished, as soon as it got quiet, fire came out of heaven, and at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, it burned up the 250 princes. Killed them all immediately. Burning. Stench. Moses told Aaron, quickly, go in amongst the burnings and gather those censers. They're hallowed. Everybody goes to bed that night. They wake up in the morning and the congregation all the congregation of the children of Israel 
murmured against Moses and Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. How much more does the Lord have to do it? And how much more spectacularly does he have to do it to get their attention? Moses killed them? Aaron? Open, they had the power to open the earth up? Send fire from heaven? The people of the Lord was their second lie. to identify them with that name. And that's when God says one more time, back off, Moses and Aaron. I'm going to consume them all as in a moment. And God begins. God begins without announcing what he's going to do, there is immediately a plague. And Moses knows and sees this plague starting to kill from one direction in the camp of the children of Israel. Moses, without going to God, without waiting to find out what God's will was, commanded Aaron to take his censer and fire from off the altar of burnt offering. Take your coals from off that and take that in that brazen censer that is yours and now go, go amongst all of the people and stand between those that are living and those that are dying. And may that censer representing the prayers of the saints on the basis of the cross, the death, the atoning death of the Son of God, be that which God smells and sees. And God does see it. And He makes a difference. The prayers based on the blood of Christ, are that which marks the line between those that die and those that remain alive. Now the history is not ended because the next challenge is will show that Aaron is to be the leader and you're going to get the history of the rod of Aaron that budded. But let us learn the lessons that God would have us learn. Here's where I wish I wasn't the, pa the pastor and I didn't hold the office because it's going to sound or could sound as if I am tooting my own horn. I am not. Let it be clear that God is making it clear to all of us all of us, that he is the one who puts into office. And we may not always like what those office bearers say, but that dislike never gives us the right to disrespect, to say to them, you put yourself there. And that's constantly the importance of the very first question that is asked of anyone when they are ordained and installed into office. Do you believe that you have been called by God's church and thus by God himself? Not by majority vote, not by men, but by God. Miriam had to learn it. You think they would have learned? We all know it. We know it. This isn't new. But God wants us tonight to be reminded. 
second. We may think it's not so serious to voice our criticisms. Let us see the seriousness of their sins by observing one more time. The earth opening up and closing. Fire coming down directly out of heaven. It's serious. It may not be taken lightly. A plague, a devastating plague that doesn't just give you some irritations, some problems for a while, but a plague that kills and could have killed every single one of them. That's serious. Third, if we remember, well, let's state the point first. It's this. Notice that grace makes a difference. And that grace works, works in the hearts and performs a work in the lives. We have to start with, do I deserve grace? And the very definition of grace is, it goes, it's the favor of God to those who don't deserve it. So I don't have the right to grace. But grace does make a difference. When, when Moses pleaded, and the nature of his plea was to look at God's promise to save unto himself a nation, a nation, a whole nation. Not just Moses and Aaron, but the whole. Then Moses' plea was based on the honor of God, and he prayed for that honor of God. And that was why Moses didn't have to ask God, what do I have to do? When that plague started, Moses, just as he knew in verse 22, oh God, you can't destroy them all, that would be contrary to your promise, knows that that censor has to go and the atonement shown to God, you promised the whole, you can't destroy the whole. And so with boldness, he followed that conviction and told Aaron, show the Lord the blood of Christ. And that's what he does all the time. Always shows us the blood of Christ. In addition, while he saves the whole of the nation, not every part, but the whole, God is identified by Moses in verse 22 in his prayer as the God of the spirits of all flesh. God, you know the hearts, and there are some who truly love thee and are striving to obey thee, just as Joshua and Caleb. Don't punish the whole for the sins of these few. And then it's worthy for us to remember that Nathan, Dathan, and Abiram died with their children. Their little ones. Mentioned specifically. But God had put a different heart into the children of, of Korah. And God made a difference. Not only in giving to the sons of Korah a different attitude, not rebellion like their father, but God also made a difference in that they did not perish with their father. Numbers 26, verse 11. Notwithstanding, the children of Korah died not. 
And so when you get to the book of Psalms, you read songs made by the sons of Korah. That's what grace does. Grace makes a difference, a powerful difference, a saving difference. Fourth, Moses and Aaron exemplify over and over what is required by those whom God would have to lead his people. First, the humility to bear abuse. Second, the humility to make those who are abusing them still the subjects of their prayers so that Moses pleads and intercedes for them immediately. Not once, but twice. The humility to intercede not because the people themselves deserve it, but because God does. And so for his people's sake, they pray. Third, the humility that when Dathan and Abiram wouldn't come to them, he would go to them. He didn't say, well, off with you. You've made your choice. Moses walked to them. He brought them the word of God. But he would go the second mile and the third. And the fourth, Moses and Aaron never forgot God's promises. They didn't let the immediate situation Make them lose sight of the big picture. So easy, so easy to get so involved in immediate circumstances and situations that you forget the big picture. Moses wouldn't forget it. He remembered the promises that God had given to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. He remembered the promises that were going to come to the line of Judah to have the Savior, the King, come from him. He remembered those promises and he presents them back to God. Now he knew they're all the total unworthiness and so that's why the final thing was he presented to God, God's promised mediator and the blood of the Christ to come. That's the way we have to pray for ourselves. We can never say, Lord, bless me because. We always have to say, Lord, for Jesus' sake. Because we're never going to forget, what do I really deserve? And then we're going to pray for our children. But we can't say, they deserve it, Lord. Because we know what they deserve. We know what we gave them. So we pray on the basis of his promises, if it is thy will. Because you don't have to, Lord. You can, you can save the children of reprobate. The Bible's full of examples. And you don't have to save ours. The Bible's full of those examples too. Because I don't deserve it. But if it is thy will, use our instruction that points to Christ. Make a difference in their hearts so they're not as sinners like me. May they be sons and daughters of Korah, not like Korah. Amen. Our Father, thy word in the historical events is powerful. It is humbling. 
Because with Paul, we have to say, but for thy grace, there go we. And that is us, but for thy grace. Give us the grace to know our salvation in Christ. Without merit, without works, in Christ alone. And especially in this week, may we know those reformational solas in Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, based on the scriptures alone, and only to thy glory. Amen. Number 13. Psalter number 13, taken from the seventh psalm. Let's sing the stanzas four, six, and seven. Four, six, and seven of number 13. Jehovah bless you and keep you. Jehovah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And Jehovah lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.